So the reason that I'm up here talking, because there are a lot of really smart people that would be talking about the space program, uh, is uh, I had a really unique experience. Um, I had the chance a few years ago, uh, we, I, every year, right around the fall after the big show, we get together and we say, okay, that was awesome. What do we do next year? And um, we were sitting around and we said, how cool would it be if we can get as many of the Apollo astronauts together for the show next year? And uh, it's really it's really pretty fun. The, the way that uh, the EA works, it's a very open door uh, place. And we're sitting there and they said, yeah, that's pretty cool. And our CEO, Jack, said, uh, uh, yeah, that'd be really neat. Have at it. And then we just kind of went on to something else. And at the end of the meeting, I was like, you said, have at it. What did you mean? He goes, go on um, down and see if you can get Apollo astronauts for uh, for us. And I'm like, okay, like that's going to be interesting. <laughs> so um, long story short, at the end of it, we were able to get uh, seven Apollo astronauts plus uh, some of the members of Mission Control, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, we interviewed about 12 of them. Uh, of the surviving ones. And, and when we got everybody sort of together, we we're putting interviews and things together, uh, a couple of them said, you know, you have a pretty interesting seat in this because we all do interviews, but we all don't do interviews with one person. Uh, and they said, you know, you should really take this material and do something to, to do talk to schools and things like that. So uh, I made a promise to several of the Apollo astronauts that I would put something together uh and here you are this is it so um so everything you hear tonight uh i made i made a, a really good effort to not do any homework um so everything you hear tonight is actually source material from them i use their interviews my time with them um to put this together so i uh, hope you enjoy it i do talk a little bit about ea's connection uh in it as well and a couple of funny stories that uh, that i have about that as well um so we'll go over to the next slide here We'll talk about the beginning of our space program. The beginning of our space program didn't necessarily come out of a, of a want for exploration. It came out of fear. Uh, October 1957, the Russians put Sputnik in the air. Um, how many people in here remember Sputnik? Anybody? <laughs> All right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say no. I, was like, oh. um, but, I do. I promise. <laughs> so um, what it was was... Uh, um, we, the United States didn't know what it was. Really, the thing just emitted a pulse, uh, but it was orbit. It was up there. It was orbiting, and people freaked out. They did not like being second. Americans don't like being second. Like a weather balloon. What's that? Like a weather balloon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a weather balloon. So, uh, so uh, the president of the United States said, "We are going to form a uh, program to go up and, and fly into space." There was something that already existed called NACA or NACA. Um, they were doing a lot of test flying, pretty wild jets, things like that. Uh, and that changed to NASA. Uh, and they first said, okay, we're going to get astronauts together. Where are we going to pull this pool from? And they actually explored a lot of different places. They were actually looking at people who built carnival rides, uh, stuntmen in Hollywood. Uh, it's a little lie. And then finally, it was, again, the President of the United States that said, no, I want test pilots. I want this to be a premier program. I want people to apply for this. These guys are used to taking risks. And that's where our, our original seven astronauts came from. They then said, um, all right, we're going to put something in space. You're going to have to track it. You're going to have to monitor the systems on board. So we're going to have to have some, some place, some headquarters to, to monitor this. Uh, so they were going to create what would become mission control. Uh, and they gave a guy the title of sort of the grandfather of mission control, but it was a, a perfect name for someone who was gonna lead uh, from the ground space exploration. His name was Christopher Columbus Kraft. And uh, he went down the hall, found an engineer uh, who he had heard about, who he had trusted. He put his name, a hand on his back and he said, you work for me now. And that gentleman was a guy by the name of Gene Kranz. Uh, Gene Kranz had been a uh, fighter pilot in Korea. He had worked on the B-52 uh, program as an engineer, and now he's worked for NASA, and uh, he's going to be one of the lead flight directors. Uh, there were several flight directors, but Gene is probably arguably the most famous because of uh, just the way they handled the rotations. Uh, Gene said that um, what they did 
was they would uh, take turns, uh, days, day shifts, and also in missions. Some would take the odd missions, some would take the even missions. Gene just drew odd missions. Um, what he didn't realize was he would get to be on Apollo 11, uh, which would be pretty famous, and then of course he'd be on Apollo 13. So um, just got got lucky with the, the missions he drew. Um, one of the tricks here, before the movie Hidden Figures had ever come out, Gene had told me that uh, he didn't trust his computers. And he says because the computers, uh, they would throw false alarms out. And they would say they were doing something and chase, he'd be chasing problems that didn't really exist. And then on one of his other trips, he said that he had absolute faith in his computers. And as we were talking, and I, I brought him up that, that quote. And uh, he said, oh, no, no. I didn't trust our monitors, our, our electronic computers that were in mission control, because they would give you alarms and let you chase on things that didn't exist. And he goes, our actual computers were women who did all the math. And he said, uh, I had absolute faith in their ability. And that's Katie. That's the real Katie Johnson, who you've seen if you've seen uh, Hidden Figures. Uh, that's the woman that uh, sort of the lead actress portrays. Um, so as we're pulling this all together, it's, it's becoming time uh, that we're going to launch something in the space. They've, they're doing tests. They're not having a lot of luck with some of the rockets. Big difference is uh, Russia is pulling ahead of us. Um, Russia did a few interesting things, uh, a lot of interesting things. Um, one of the biggest things we were doing is we were testing our rockets, and we were letting the media have full access to our launches, our tests, everything. That wasn't happening in Russia. So in Russia, if they had a success, it was a big success. But if they had a failure, you didn't even hear about it. We're still not really always hearing about it. But uh, but that's a Mercury spacecraft. Looks a lot different than an F-86 Sabre or something really uh, sleek or uh, fun to fly. Uh, single pilot. Um, but of course, as they were getting ready to send up their our first astronaut, this guy beats us. And Gargarian uh, beat us up. Not only did he fly in space first, he actually orbited already. So we're really behind the eight ball. We're, we're, we're falling behind, but it's because we're so focused on getting someone to fly in space and bring them back safely, which is uh, pretty important for us, very important for the astronaut. Um, those are our tests that uh, the media was covering. So now you have Russia, who's got a guy up there, and all that our media has to show is these explosions and failures that we've had. But... That's going to change. Guy by the name of Al Shepard is going to go up there and, and sit on top of a rocket. Now, keep in mind that two weeks before he's going to fly, that explosion picture I showed you is what happened. This is two weeks later. He's sitting on top of the rocket. And Gene said that when they were up there, he says, I'm in mission control. Alan Shepard's out on top of the rocket. It's the first time we ever actually had a man in the capsule on top of the rocket. We're going to launch him. And he said, we're in countdown, and we keep getting holds. People are pausing the countdown, the admission control. And he says, and I'm looking around, and what it really is, is nobody wants to say go. There's nothing wrong. And, but we're, everybody just is, is pausing the countdown for no reason. And he says, I see that, and I'm trying to think of what to say. And he says, and right at the perfect time, he goes, here comes Al Shepard, key, key in the mic. And he just says, all right, guys, let's light this candle. And he says that just just excited everybody in the room. And as the countdown clock happened, it was ticking the rest of the way down. He didn't realize he had a stuck mic. So his mic was stuck open. So everything he said could be transported, <laughs> translated uh, there. And uh, they said, uh, Shepard said, Lord, don't let me F up. And uh, he <laughs> says at NASA, that still is called Shepard's Prayer. And uh, oh so uh, they, of course, launched successfully, finally putting uh, an American uh, in space. Uh, oh, it is one second. Just want to bring that up. Here we go. Here we are. Um, February 20th. So in between here, we flew Glenn, uh, um, Shepard flies, Gus flies. Gus flashes down and his capsule, uh, the hatch, blows off, sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Um, if you watch the right stuff, uh, the movie, it kind of portrays it as he was kind of blackballed by NASA. Totally not true. That was totally Hollywood. Uh, it's also uh, 
it was proven almost immediately that the hatch could just blow. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the astronauts, when they were trying to simulate it, the only way you can get that hatch open was to punch this, uh, this sort of button, if you will. And if you punch that, you would get this big ring on your hand. Every one of them had it. And Gus didn't have it. Gus didn't blow the hatch. Also, each of the original seven astronauts had a backup system or something that they were responsible for. And Gus's was recovery. So of all the astronauts that would have panicked and blown a hatch, Gus would have been the least likely. Uh, however, he was really upset that he did lose his spacecraft. But as a testament to that, if you think about it, it in that movie, it kind of shows that, that Gus gets blackballed. Gus went and flew on Gemini again, and then he was head of a, the first Apollo program, or first Apollo mission. So if you were blackballed by NASA, you wouldn't still be flying. Uh, so, um, so right after this, John Glenn goes up. John Glenn becomes the first American in orbit. And he returns back safely. John F. Kennedy goes to Rice University. At this time, I think we had a combined time of something around, I think it was maybe 35, 40 minutes of combined space flight time, something crazy like that. John, and he goes out there and says, we're going to go to the moon, and we're going to do it before the decade's out. And we're going to go to the moon. We're going to return back uh, the astronaut safely again. Very important for that astronaut. Um, but think about this. He's talking about this the equipment needed to build the machines to go to the moon don't even exist yet. And he's talking about going by the end of the decade. I mean, that is a gauntlet to lay down. But at NASA, everybody was pretty excited because it showed to them that the President of the United States believed in the program because a lot of them were starting to wonder, where, where were we going with this? Well, the next step was Gemini. And what I always tell everybody is think of it this way. Um, Mercury was just to see, could we go up there? Can we even get somebody up and down safely? Uh, Gemini is, okay, we can get up there. Now, what can we do? You know, we're gonna have to learn some some pretty intense things if we're gonna go to the moon. And then make no mistake, Apollo was the moon landing. That's what it was the, the goal there. So Gemini or Gemini, depending on uh, what generation you grew up in, uh, that's what their spacecraft looked like. Uh, still not looking like an F-86 Sabre, but, uh, uh, a little bit, a uh, little bit cool though. It has two man crew on this one. Some of the first, uh, some of the big highlights on uh, Gemini's course was the first EVA, uh, and that was uh, Ed White who got out there and uh, performed his EVA. Jim McDivitt, mission commander, next to him. Got to talk to Jim McDivitt uh, on the phone, and I said, uh, Jim, you know, you're up in space. Open the door. Ed gets out. What's that like? And he's like, it was awful lonely with that outside. He goes, I can tell you that. Uh, he said, we were actually supposed to do a second EVA, but the door, we had problems getting the hatch secured and we didn't want to risk it again. We eventually did get the door secured and we said, we're not going to risk it and go out again. So we didn't do it. Um, there was uh, a few moments where they had an equipment issue. They had to straighten and Ed White had free time during the EVA, which was something completely unheard of. And he just got to hang out and look at the, Earth going by. Um, rendezvous. First time we're going to take two uh, spacecraft, do a rendezvous, formation flight. Uh, they call it station keeping. Um, really funny story. If you look at this, there's a sign in the window that says Beat Army. Um, that was, so this is Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 that flew this. Gemini 7 uh, was up there first. Gemini 6 comes up and joins them. And uh, the Entire Gemini 6 crew was Navy, and then Gemini 7 was Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. And uh, Jim Lovell, uh, Navy guy, uh, Frank Borman went to West Point. Uh, and at the time of this flight, the Army-Navy game's going on. Uh, so uh, as a joke, uh, they put the, uh, the beat Army sign in the window. And uh, Frank says, I saw that come up. He said, I just keep my mic. And I said, oh, look, somebody put a sign in the window that says beat Navy. And he said, I saw the sign kind of come down for a few seconds. And what it was, was he was checking to make sure he had the right sign <laughs> put it back in the window. So uh, Gemini 7 was really funny, though. They said, uh, I, I talked to Frank a good bit about this. And he said, uh, you know, they were up there. They did their station keeping mission, showed that they can join up and, and fly formation. Gemini 6 goes home. Gemini 7 has another week up there. They, had a, they did a two-week endurance flight. And you have to understand, it's not like Apollo. It's not like a shuttle. You're strapped into a seat. I mean, so it, you're up in a car seat about the size of a Volkswagen, everybody said. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I said, what was that? 
like? And, and Frank said, well, it got pretty long. And then he says, and you're either going to emerge uh, mortal enemies or best friends with your co-pilot. <laughs> and he says, luckily, uh, me and Lava were best friends. Um, he said they lost a toothbrush uh, on, I think, like the second or third day. So they had to share a toothbrush. Uh, they had a song stuck in their head after the first week that they kept humming and singing. Uh, and he says it was pretty bad. And he says uh, when we landed and we splashed down, the frogmen came out and they opened up the hatch. And he says, he says it must have smelled really bad because the frogmen's eyes got like really big, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, they immediately got out on deck and they announced that they were engaged after spending two weeks uh, together. <laughs> there. So, um, Jem and I went really according to plan. I mean, it went really smooth. We got really lucky with all the Gemini missions. Um, so now it's time for Apollo. And we're going to go and uh, uh, take those first steps toward landing on the moon, fulfilling uh, Kennedy's promise. And we're actually kind of on track. I mean, things are going pretty smoothly. Uh, so it's time for Apollo 1. And Apollo 1 uh, will be manned by Gus Grissom, uh, Ed White, Roger Chaffee. Um, these two guys are, are veterans. Uh, Roger Chaffee is a, a rookie. And uh, basically, they were the, the backup crew. Every crew has a backup, where if one of them gets sick, something like that, another crew is trained up, can step in and help. Uh, the backup crew does a what they call plugs-in test, which would be basically like putting jumper cables on your car, cranking up the radio, making sure everything works. Um, Everything's going good. Uh, so the backup crew, no problem. Prime crew gets in, they're going to do something called a uh, plugs out test. What it is, they're going to pull the ground power, uh, make sure that the rocket can actually support itself, all of its life support systems, uh, computers, all kinds of things. It's a, it's a nothing test. I mean, it's not dangerous. It's not considered hazardous. Uh, as a matter of fact, Gene Kranz had been working some late hours, and uh, they said, why don't you go home tonight, take the night off, take your wife out to dinner, do something like that. So Gene says, uh, I'm at home. And, you know, they all lived in this big neighborhood together. And he says, there's a knock at the door. And uh, I went down and answered the door. And it was my neighbor who worked with me at, the K or at the Houston, and he said, uh, uh, Gene, we lost the crew. And he said, well, where are they? And he says, you know, astronauts will sometimes wander off or do whatever. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, no, they're dead. There was a fire. And Gene said, that that can't even be. So he says, I, I drove the mission control. And uh, he said there was a, it was all locked down, but there was a back elevator I knew how to get into. And I took that elevator up. And he said, I got into mission control. I immediately knew something bad had happened. He goes, I was looking at people. Who had seen a bad event and uh and that's what exactly had happened uh there's a lot of explanations whoops hit the wrong button that was my fault sorry um there's a lot of explanation to it really what happened uh was lack of imagination as frank borman said um nobody ever thought there would be a fire on the launch pad you know, everything you ever thought of to, to learn space flight, you thought about how we're going to fight fire in space. Nobody ever thought there might be a fire sitting here on the pad. Uh, it was a combination of the way they were testing with pure oxygen. Uh, it was also pressurized and kind of tuned up uh, uh, to simulate the, the conditions of space flight. Uh, they, had, uh, they had Velcro added into places where they, they shouldn't have Velcro. Uh, they were told about it, and they kind of ignored it. It was kind of a field mod. Uh, and it was a combination of all of that. Uh, it was a spark uh, below their feet that uh, leaked out uh, due to a frayed wire. Frayed wire was because it was rubbing against a panel that kept being open and closed, a service panel. You put all that together and you had a fire. Um, that all took longer. That explanation that I just gave you took longer than the actual time that it took for the astronaut to pass away in the fire. I think it took them something like 13 seconds or something like that before the hull ruptured on the Apollo 1 capsule. Um, so in today's corporate America, I think you would see a lot of people trying to cover up or say, here's what the problem is. Um, not these guys. This was a different generation. Gene Kranz goes into his room, calls all his mission controllers together. And he said, this was our fault because we all knew there were problems. None of us stood up and said, damn it, stop. 
And he goes, you're going to go back to your control panels. You're going to write the words tough and competent on your dry erase boards at your, your stations. And you're never going to erase that. And that's going to be an ongoing memorial to Grissom, Chappie, and White, that we're never going to lose another crew this way again. Uh, Frank Borman would end up having to testify before Congress, uh, who he pretty much saved the space program because there was a lot of people that wanted to end it. And Frank uh, went up and basically told him, stop this witch hunt, let's go to the moon, this is what we do. Um, so now, think about this. You're the backup crew on Apollo 1, and your prime crew died in a fire. So everybody always asks, what happens to these Apollo missions in between 1 and 7? Well, they existed, but they were unmanned tests. Uh, they were testing the new command module. They went back and redesigned the command module to what they called the Block 2. And so Apollos 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 were unmanned. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's kind of funny, that famous shot you always see of the Saturn V kind of coming apart and the ring comes off, you can see the engine. That's Apollo 6, that's an unmanned mission. Uh, but it looks really good, so, so let's use it. Uh, but now, time for Apollo 7. They're going to go up in space and test this Block 2 command module. This is the backup crew that was in the rocket the night before the fire. These are the guys that are going to go test this thing. This was the backup crew. Could have been them sitting in that rocket, uh, but it wasn't. Just luck of the draw. So uh, Apollo 7 uh, would would indeed go up and test that mission, uh, and uh, uh, it, it went okay, except they got head colds up there, which wasn't fun. Uh, Walt Cunningham told me I didn't have a head cold, but if Wally Schra has a head cold, everybody has a head cold. Uh, so uh, what's interesting is Wally Schra insisted on a few changes, one of which was he was going to have a pad leader. He was going to have somebody up there to help get them out if there was a fire. He was going to have somebody up there overlooking the spacecraft at all times. So uh, they got a, a guy of German descent. He was an engineer. He was a contractor at first, and then they hired him at NASA. His name was Gunther Wendt, and uh, they used to call him the Pat Fuhrer. Uh, Wally Schrell likes to play a lot of jokes, uh, so... They actually took his hard hat and he made it into a Colonel Clink helmet <laughs> once. Uh, a lot of a lot of fun stuff like that. But Gunther, uh, if you watch the movie Apollo 13, you'll hear them say, like, I wonder where Gunther went. Like, that's who they're talking about. Uh, he was uh, a very vital part of this program. Somebody else who was a very important part of the program was Bill Um uh, What they were finding out were the astronauts were sort of hiding ailments, if they could, from the flight surgeons. Uh, because they didn't want them to be grounded. And the flight surgeons, in turn, were grounding you for any little thing. So they wanted to try to build trust. So what they did was they got America's first aerospace nurse, Dee O'Hara. Uh, she was just out of college. Uh, and basically, her job was to inspect them, have open dialogue with them, with the understanding of as long as you're not going to affect the mission, I'm not going to bring it up to the flight surgeon to give them a little bit of privacy as well onto their, uh, their health. Um, she also had a lot of jokes played on her, by the way. Wally Shira uh, dropped off his urine sample in a five-gallon drum uh, on his on her desk. Uh, he had lollipops taped to it, all kinds of stuff. So uh, pretty pretty wild guy. Uh, but Apollo 7 was a success. They flew the command module. It worked. We're on our way. Now it's time for the next mission. And it's also time for the next rocket, Saturn V. Um, the Saturn V is a, it's as tall as a 35-story building, seven and a half million pounds of thrust. It has enough thrust to take a 737 airliner and put it in lunar orbit. Uh, it's as tall as the Empire or not Empire State of uh, uh, Statue of Liberty. Thank you. Uh, so a pretty impressive machine. <laughs> the crew that's going to take it is Apollo 8. So Jim Lovell uh, is is accompanying uh, his commander again, uh, Frank Borman. And Bill Anders is going with him. Uh, Bill Anders would be the lunar module pilot, even though they didn't have a lunar module because of some changes in the schedule. Uh, they're going to go around the moon, and it would put them in, in lunar orbit. They'd actually be up there Christmas Eve. Now, I have a lot of sort of background in this one just because of the exhibit, because of our time with Frank. Um, but Frank said, uh, they came down and said to us, make no mistake, you have a one in three chance of coming home. Uh, and Frank said, but you went. That was what you signed up for. We had to, in his, make no mistake, Frank said, we had to beat the Russians. This was a Cold War mission. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so it's really interesting. Uh, when I asked him about uh, the liftoff, 
uh, of the Saturn V because in my head I'm like that had to be incredible. He was like, "No, nah, the Saturn V was an old man's car," and I was like, "Really?" And he's like, "Yeah, it was pretty, uh, pretty cool." And he goes, "Well, it, it shook a little bit on the ground, you know." And Jim Lovell uh, said, "Yeah, you know, the the Gemini was was rougher." And Bill Anders said, I thought we exploded on liftoff. He goes, I actually thought we, I was being shoved through the control panel. I thought, I thought the thing blew up. Um, and he goes, Frank says it was an old man's ride. He goes, however, there was an abort handle, the T handle. And he goes, and Frank was sitting there like that. You're supposed to have your hand on the T handle. He had his hand like that. And now after they got into space and smoothed out, one of them asked Frank about it. He said, I'd rather die than make a false abort. He goes, I was afraid I'd been shaking and pull that handle and we would abort the mission. So um, now first time we're going to leave low Earth orbit. First time we're going to fly to Saturn V. Uh, we're going to go out in space uh, and, and actually go into lunar orbit and park out there. Uh, so first time we're going to go into what they call the TLI. Um, and hopefully it all works and they're going to come home, right? One in three chance. Uh, while the mission is uh, going on, Deke Slayton tells Susan Borman, uh, Frank's wife, that uh, things are going really great. And, you know, don't worry. I think there's a 50% chance we're going to get him home now. And uh, she was like, I think that was supposed to be good news, but uh, uh, still pretty wild. Wow. Yeah. Uh, while they're, now you have, to, have to understand, Frank, Frank is a mission oriented guy. Everything's on schedule. And uh, as they're, coming around the moon while they were actually looking for other landing sites, one of the orbits they made, the capsules oriented a different way, and they were able to see that. Arguably one of the most famous pictures ever taken in spaceflight is Earthrise. Um, while they're coming around, you can hear Bill Anders. You can go on YouTube and watch some really cool videos of it, but Bill Anders says, oh my God, and you can hear them kind of excitingly looking for different color film and different settings. Um, you kind of hear Frank tells them that that picture is not scheduled. Uh, as a joke, you know, but uh, uh, after a few minutes, you actually hear Frank say for real, like, all right, let's get back to work. You know, it would be hard to do when you're looking at that out the window. Um, they also had a uh, reading from the book of Genesis while they were up there. Uh, they came back and were sued. Uh, there was a woman who was an atheist who said that uh, you shouldn't have been reading from the Bible while you guys were up there. And Frank said, you know, all we were told, we were given no guidance other than say something appropriate while you're up there. You can have more people listening. Uh, and watching than ever before. And Frank actually didn't want to take a, a, a TV camera or anything with him. It was Deke Slayton that said, no, Frank, it's important. You need to take a camera with you. So um, so they come back okay. Uh, time for Apollo 9. Apollo 9 is going to use the first time they're going to take up the lunar module. Uh, lunar module is the mighty machine that's going to land on the moon, right? Well, it looks like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, they called it Spider. Um, now, something you have to understand about Gus, we're going to go back to Gus for a second. Uh, Gus had his uh, first uh, spacecraft uh, named Liberty Bell. His second, that Liberty Bell is the one that sank, uh, it, which, by the way, is recovered, and you can go see it in Kansas, the Cosmosphere Museum. He did a beautiful job of it. Uh, his second spacecraft, uh, Gemini, uh, they asked him, what do you want to name it? And he said, the unsinkable Molly Brown. And uh, they said, well, no, that's not really positive. Pick a second name. And he said, OK, Titanic 2. Uh, and they said, all right, never mind. We'll go with Molly Brown. However, immediately after that, they actually stopped naming spacecraft. So now they come back and they said, well, we're going to have two spacecraft up there at the same time. We really should just go ahead and let them start naming the spacecraft again. First time, there, and I think they were hoping for something majestic, you know, like Endeavor or Columbia or something. Well, what happened, these guys see this thing, and Jim McDivitt said, I went down the Grumman where they were building this, and there's this thing sitting in the corner that's put together with tape and these big staples. And I said, I know you guys have to make these mock-ups and everything. He goes, but the next time I come down, is there a way that I can have something a little closer to what the flight article is going to look like that I can look over? And they said, no, that's the one you're taking. <laughs> uh, and he's like, oh, my God, you know, I mean, it was a really crude looking machine, you know, uh, and, you know, he's like, it's a matter of fact, it's so light and it's so clumsy, you can't fly it on Earth. You can't train in the land here. So, uh, so at any rate, they named it Spider because they thought it looked like a big spider. And the first time they saw their command module, it was actually wrapped in a pink preservative paper or wrapping. Uh, so they named it Gumdrop. 
Uh, so NASA didn't get Columbia or Endeavor or something like that. They got Gumdrop and Spider. Uh, they did go up and fly the machine, though, and it performed exactly how they needed it to. Um, Apollo 10 would uh, be the – it kind of gets a bum rap as the dress rehearsal. Um, but in, in some ways it is. But really, they were testing the approaches, testing the hardware. They had to test in the board, which was extremely dangerous. Um, and it's really funny because I've heard a lot of stories, and I, and I believe them, uh, that the lunar module was built too heavy to land on the moon. It had a lot of sensors and it had a different equipment package on it. Um, but I'll tell you that one of my first days working EA, Gene Cernan called in and he was actually renewing his EA membership and I got to talk to him. And he said, you know, they said they trusted me. And he goes, but Deke said, now, now Gene, don't land on the moon. And he said, because we were going to have to make the approach in the board. He said, yeah, I know. And he says, no, Gene, really, don't land on the moon. And he says, oh, I won't. And he goes, I think they believed me. And he goes, but they also short-fueled my limb just in case. And he goes, so we didn't have enough fuel to actually get there. But he said, they were, they were going to keep me honest. Um, but they also had to do, again, uh, they get billed as the dress rehearsal, and that's kind of unfair because uh, every mission had to build on the next mission. So if Apollo 10 tests didn't all go accordingly, Apollo 11 would not have been a moon landing. It would have been more tests to have to uh, get the objectives done in that order. Um, so here we are, Apollo 11. What we now know is the lunar mission, uh, the first landing. Um, Eagle would be the uh, uh, lunar module, and Columbia is the command module. Uh, Neil Armstrong would lead the mission. Um, Buzz Aldrin would go down to the lunar surface with him, and Mike Collins would, uh, would get uh, stuck up there in the command module by himself. Uh, I asked Mike, I said, you know, did that bother you? And he says, man, when those guys got out of there, I couldn't wait. I got to listen to the music I wanted to. Like, <laughs> and he says, the only problem is, is once they left to go to the lunar surface, every time a pump would turn on, or you would hear a different noise. He'd say, you, what was that? You know, he said, you started really paying attention because now you're all by yourself up there in the command module. Um, now, early on in the space program, the Mercury guys, we talked about how every mission was built on one another. Those Mercury guys had to fight for the right of the astronaut to be a pilot and at the end of the day have control and have the ability to turn off an autopilot and manually control a spacecraft. And those engineers that they were fighting, they had absolute faith in, in the stuff that they were building. They said, you're never going to need to go into manual control. Well, Apollo 11, as they're going down to the lunar surface, the computer runs along and shoots them over their landing site. And it's actually putting them in a place that you're not able to land. It's a big crater. Neil Armstrong takes over manual control and lands that like a helicopter, uh, basically on the lunar surface. Down in mission control, uh, they're taking down time till few remaining. There was no, uh, I guess, nobody ever thought about what should you say when you land. That was never actually briefed. Uh, Neil lands this thing with, I think it was like 13 seconds left of fuel remaining and uh, touches down him and Buzz start going through the shutdown list to shut the thing down. Mission control is down there waiting, and they still haven't heard if they've landed or not, but by their watches, they're out of gas. So they're all just kind of quiet. And then Neil is like, oh, we need to let them know that we're down. And he keys the mic, and he just says, tranquility base, the eagle has landed. Awesome transmission. Uh, but if you ever find, if you go listen to it on YouTube, the, the immediate reaction from mission controls one they didn't uh, they couldn't say tranquility base right because they had never heard that before and the second one he actually continues to say like you have a bunch of guys about to turn blue we can start breathing again down here so we had done it we've gotten this far and gene cran said we missed it we were so focused on our computer screens that we we did not you know look up and, and start looking at, at the data and it didn't even dawn on us like okay we're down until like a good few minutes, we're like, oh my God, we, we did it, we're down, you know. Um, so they go out, of course, uh, start uh, exploring the, uh, the uh, lunar surface. Buzz Aldrin said something I never heard. He goes, we, all, we thought we were going to die uh, the first two and a half minutes on the lunar surface because when we landed, there was a pressure gauge in the limb. And he says, and it was spiking. And he said, there was nothing we can do except watch it. And if it spiked to the top, the thing would rupture. And he says, that's it. We're just sitting there waiting to see if we were going to go or not. And for whatever reason, the, the pressure settled and, and we were okay. 
They moved up their EVA so they can go out and uh, go on the lunar surface quicker than they were supposed to. Um, and I asked Buzz, I said, well, well, what's the first thing you did, you know, when you got out there? And he said, well, Neil got out first. He was mission commander. I got out second. The first thing that we did, was we took a lunar sample and we immediately put it in the lens. And that way, in case we had to abort, we had to leave suddenly or whatever, we still had that soil that we can bring back. We had something. And um, it was really funny. One of the people I was interviewing him with, uh, who's totally not an airplane person, asked a question that at first I was like, that's a dumb question. And they were like, what did the moon smell like? And I'm just like looking like, well, they were in a suit, you know? And I'm like, oh, I'm sitting to myself. I'm like, what a dumb question that was. And Neil was like, oh, that's actually a great question. Or Buzz was like, that's a great question. And I'm like, How, what? And he says, there are, after our first time out on the uh, surface, when we got back in, one of the first things we had to do was smell the soil and describe it while we were sitting in the, in the lens that evening. And uh, he says, it really smelled like somebody had poured water over a campfire. And he said, that's, that's the best uh, sort of explanation I can give. It. That's what it smelled like. Um, that person I was with then asked uh, Buzz what he thought Mars was going to smell like, and I think he took like a 45-minute uh, <laughs> answer, which I was way over my head. So, uh, so uh, Apollo 11 gets back. We had to do that important part, right? Return them safely to Earth. Uh, and in Gene Kranz's words, that's when you could take a break. That's when everybody's home safe. That's when the mission took success. Uh, Apollo 12. I think if any mission that I was going to want to go on, I think this would be the one. Uh, these guys were a hoot. Uh, they were best friends. Um, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to Pete Conrad, uh, but I, I talked to Dick Gordon and Al Bean, and uh, uh, both of them said it was like the ultimate road trip where your mother gave you the keys to this hot rod. And then she said, and here's your two best buddies. See you in a while. You know, and she said, and he said, that's that's what it was like. Uh, Pete Conrad, uh, his famous quote is, if you can't be good, be colorful. Um, their big thing was they went out and got matching Corvettes. Uh, the Corvettes are something that we ought to talk about. Uh, that goes all the way back to the Mercury program. Um, there was a Corvette dealer uh, and, and basically uh, said, well, you guys, want everybody cared what the astronauts wore, drove, you know, ate, everything. So he said, uh, I'll lease you guys a Corvette, I'll lease you guys two cars, uh, two cars, one for you and one for your wife for a dollar. Uh, and that was the deal that they made. Um, and they said, you know, usually our wives would choose a car that the family can go in. And uh, the Apollo 12 guys, they said, but no self-respecting astronaut would choose anything but Corvette to drive. Uh, the only two astronauts of the Apollo era that did not drive Corvettes uh, were John Glenn, uh, John Glenn had a station wagon, and Frank Borman had a pickup truck. Uh, so the, those, and they said we don't knock the guys who had the Corvettes; it just wasn't our style. So, um, so at any rate, these guys had their Corvettes painted to match one another, um, and they actually had their uh, crew position. Those are those colors on the side are all their equipment are color coded for the lunar module pilot, the mission commander, command module pilot. Um, so that every one of their end things had their initials. Uh, in that sort of section of the of wh who has, whose ever car that was. Um, so Gene said, I was off for Apollo 12. Somebody was up to be prime flight director. And uh, this we were kind of ready for an easy mission. Apollo 11 had a lot of, you know, a lot of almost uh, catastrophes. Well, these guys didn't even make it into the launch mode without uh, causing a problem. Uh, during liftoff, they got struck by lightning. Nobody ever thought about the fact that launching in the middle of a storm uh, could hit the rocket, which is exactly what happened. Uh, during the liftoff, they got hit. The uh, uh, lightning streak actually traced the uh, contrails down and actually hit the pad. Uh, all the electronics in the spacecraft kicked off. The only thing that was running good was the engines. Those engines were, were full throttle. Uh, and Al Bean said uh, they called up for mission control and said flip SCE to auxiliary. And he goes, the problem is it was a little switch over in my corner of the command module, and we never even used it in the simulator. Uh, and he goes, as a matter of fact, when they called that up, Pete Conrad said, what the hell is that on the radio? And Al Bean says, well, I know what it is. I always wondered what this thing did. And he says, I switched it. And what it did was it started to cycle. It basically allowed them to start to cycle the equipment back so that um, mission control can try to bring their systems back up. So basically, like rebo rebooting your iPhone is how they tell everybody. Uh, but uh, they, uh, of course, uh, did 
successfully get up into uh, uh, orbit or up into the to the moon. I uh, landed on the moon in true Pete Conrad style. Uh, Pete's uh, first words on the lunar surface were, "It may have been a big one or a small one for Neil, but it's a big one for me." Um, they were actually trying to get Pete Conrad was trying to get Neil Armstrong because the only thing he had was sort of a fixed camera at first that's attached to the limb. And he wanted uh, Neil to land, and instead of saying that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he wanted to say, oh my God, what is that? And then just jump out of frames, and then leave everybody guessing for a few minutes. <laughs> Neil, Neil was too straight laced, he wouldn't do it. Uh, so uh, the other fun thing is one of the guys in Mission Control sabotaged their checklist on their flight suits, uh, and they put centerfolds to Playboy on there. So they're on the lunar surface, and they're flipping through uh, what sample they're supposed to get next. And it would flip one page and there's just a centerfold, you know, on their uh, uh, thing. And it's really funny. If you guys have ever watched, uh, there's a great miniseries called From the Earth to the Moon, which if you haven't seen it, it was an HBO one done several years ago, but it's really good. And they, they cover some of the fun stuff like that. So Apollo 13, Gene said, all right, we're ready for a nice, smooth mission now. Uh, we got Apollo 12's bump out of the way. Uh, these guys didn't even make it into the spacecraft without a bump. Um, what happened was the backup crew uh, was exposed to German measles. The prime crew uh, had already had the measles, except for one member of the crew, Ken Mattingly. Uh, they had no choice. They had to bump the crew. So uh, they had to bump uh, Ken Mattingly from the mission. Jack Swagger would fill in from the backup crew. Um, not a big deal, except for now you suddenly or just a few days out from this flight. And right a few days in from the flight, the backup crew does kind of chill out a little bit and he sort of help with the backup plans and the media interviews and stuff like that suddenly you're taking somebody from the backup crew putting them on the prime crew uh so now you've got to hurry up and train so they said they got into sim it's train 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 get in the rocket go and they said they're actually on their way into space and jack swagger said you know i forgot to file my income taxes uh, and all this. So they actually did radio back to the president and ask it for an extension for Jack Swaggart's uh, income tax. Oh, which they, yeah. um, they were about three days in, I think, uh, and they were doing a live television broadcast. And believe it or not, at this point, it's supposed to be a live television broadcast. The networks actually dumped them. Uh, the networks were saying people are already bored with going to the moon. Could you imagine that? Going to the moon was boring. Um, so uh, they did the live broadcast, though. They're putting everything away. Gene Cran said the uh, day shift down in Houston is kind of getting done. You're kind of doing your house cleaning, just making sure that you know everything's kind of cleaned up. Your your relief is in the room. You don't want to hand them a mess or anything like that. And uh, they said uh, one of the things one of the guys called out. He says, you know, I'll, I'll kind of take care of this oxygen tankster so that my relief doesn't have to worry about it. All that is, is you're, you're stirring up the oxygen inside the tank. This is the stuff that actually helps power some of the equipment on board. Uh, and all that's doing is to get you a good measurement of what how much oxygen you have on board. That's what you're stirring the tank for. And uh, he calls up and says, go ahead and stir your tank. And the next thing you know, uh, boom, th there's, this is going on. Uh, and initially, Gene said, we thought it was instrumentation just because of those computer problems that happened. Uh, and he says, but of course, they started talking about the nature of what they were seeing. Uh, and then he says, it really changed for us. And Jim Lovell uh, called down and said, I can see that we're venting. Uh, and he says, well, this is real. And uh, Gene called his uh, force in. He says, we're going to work the problem. Let's settle down and let's not make anything worse by guessing. Um, they went around the room, figured out a way to get these guys back, which was a risky maneuver, but it was about the only maneuver you had. Uh, I was about to take them backside around the moon. Uh, you're going to slingshot them. And this is what, keep in mind, they didn't, they couldn't see this while they were flying. It wasn't until they jettisoned their service module on the way home uh, that they could see that basically one whole part of the command or service module was, was blown away. Uh, it was actually a uh, oxygen tank intended for Apollo 10. It was dropped on the floor. Um, they inspected it. They thought it looked okay and installed it in the service module that would become attached for Apollo 13. Uh, but uh, at any rate, that's what happened, and that's why it caused the explosion. Um, now they're going to have to live in this guy. That thing it's just made for landing on the moon, thing held together with tape and staples. It's about to come to here. It was a lifeboat. 
they said they're looking at it and it takes something like two or three hours to power up the, the lunar module. Uh, they said they didn't, they knew they didn't have that much time. They were running out of life support and command module. There was one rehearsal they had ran in a simulator just to try it. And they, they had names for some of these sims that they would use, like some of these uh, scenarios. And this one was called Lifeboat Lem. And they said the mission control keyed the mic and just said, Fredo, Lifeboat Lem to Fred Hayes. Fred Hayes immediately goes down into the lunar module and starts powering it up. Not thinking about it, not really 100% going by the checklist. It's just get the systems online so we can close this, close out the command module. You got to keep that alive because that's the only thing that can get you back to, into reentry. Um, thankfully, through a lot of hard work, through mission control, the engineers there figuring out how to build a, a filter. Uh, I mean, just I think if anything else had happened, I'm not sure Apollo 13 would have gotten home. I mean, it was getting pretty bleak. Um, but they were able to get them on the USS Iwo Jima, uh, and that's them at the recovery. Um, Gene said that the whole time those guys were up there, uh, they never complained. And he said the worst thing I ever did was as they were working through scenarios in that simulator, uh, if you've seen the movie, uh, there were three astronauts actually working on that that in that simulator. It was actually Frank, uh, jo Joe Engel, and then Ken Mattingly, the astronaut that was bumped from the mission. Ken Mattingly wouldn't take a break. They kept trying to get Ken to go take a break, go get something to eat, coffee. He would not leave. And uh, Gene, on the other side, is worried because this is everything is done by a checklist, and they don't have this checklist. This is something that's going to be. Uh, and he says, I, "I we only got one shot at this, or we're going to lose these guys, and I don't want to lose them because we flipped the wrong switch in the wrong order, and that's." down to so um basically they, they finally got done and said hey the scenario the, the procedures are ready we're gonna bring them over and gene cran said i told them don't send ken because ken's emotional and he says these are his buddies up there and he says send joe or anybody else well they sent ken and ken comes in and he says i'll give you the the, the procedures and then I'm, I'm i'll leave and they didn't leave so Gene said, I made a mistake. And I told him, if you're going to stay here, go stand up there with Joe Kerwin and work Capcom. And he goes, that was the worst mistake I ever made. Because it's not like you knew exactly all the time where they were going to be. You had to kind of bounce it off of like repeaters and, and, and towers. So he, they're up there trying to raise them as they came through reentry. They came through reentry shallow, so it took longer for them to come back. So it was almost by dramatic fashion. You're sitting there hoping that they made it through. Uh, and, and it's taking longer than they ever had before. And Gene said, I'm trying to close my eyes and just clear my head for a minute. And he says, but my earpiece is in. And all I can hear in my earpiece is Ken in the front of the room going, he, uh, Odyssey used to. He's, it's Ken looking for his friend. And he goes, that was the worst decision I ever made. I should have made him leave the room. Uh, but uh, luckily, uh, uh, they did splash down uh, safely, got recovered on the Iwo Jima, as you see there. And uh, we learned, whoops. Uh, what we learned on Apollo 13, we adapted into other missions. Frank brought up the point that he's really glad it happened on 13 and not 8, because uh, they didn't have a lunar module. So he <laughs> said so it would have been a pretty bad deal. Um, Apollo 14 uh, would see one of the original uh, seven go back up into space, Al Shepard. Uh, Al Shepard once in an interview after his uh, Mercury flight said uh, that he was asked, where do you see yourself before your career is out? And he said, I'm going to play golf on the moon. Uh, it's exactly what he did. He actually had a sand wedge made onto a, uh, a NASA instrument and somehow hid it from anybody from noticing. Uh, got it onto the uh, lunar surface and uh, hit two golf balls. Um, first one was a duck. The second one, he said, went for miles and miles. Uh, mission control said it looked like a slice to them, but they'll take his uh, word for it. <laughs> and uh, that would get us into Apollo 15. Um, Apollo 15, well, let me go. Did I just jump? Oops. Okay, Apollo 15, here we go. Um, so I guess something I had to talk about before. Apollo 14, that backup crew, uh, Joe Engel was one of those backup crew guys. Apollo 14 backup crew made their own patch. And in that patch was this. And what this made fun of was the Apollo 15 prime crew. 
basically calling out Shepard Old by making a coyote with the old beard and the Roadrunner has went up to the moon. The joke was is that uh, Al Shepard always says this, this backup crew wants to go so bad that if I go to the bathroom, they're going to steal the rocket and go without me. <laughs> uh, so they made this patch and, and he hated that patch. He could not stand it. So in true fashion, they hid these patches all over the Apollo 14 command module. They're, they're just everywhere stuffed in every, every place you can put one. So if you go and read the transcripts to the mission, you'll actually hear Al Shepard complaining about these patches to the point that he gets down onto the lunar surface. He's got like the pack on and he's walking around and there's one on the back of the pack. And, uh, they're like, like, you aren't going to like this, but there's one of those patches on your, on the back of your life support. So, um, Apollo 15 in true Al Warden style, he's going to take a car with him. Uh, Al Warden, if he, I always tell people, if you wanted to talk to a, an astronaut Apollo guy, that was one of those true hard, Corvette driving astronauts, Al Warden was your guy. And like I said, his first mission, he decided he's going to take a car with him up there. Um, but that was it. It was the first time we were going to take the lunar rover, give us uh, a little bit of uh, longer legs out on the lunar surface. This was the heaviest Saturn V to launch. Uh, it was because of the uh, research uh, experiments they had on board. Uh, they also did the deepest space EVA. It's Al that did that. Uh, pretty wild stuff. This was also the first mission. That if you think about it, uh, these guys were all test pilots going up there. And there were some folks in the scientific community that were saying, this is great. However, we should give these guys more science training. Um, we really should give them geology training so that they're getting smarter samples up on the lunar surface instead of just getting up there and grabbing anything that they could find. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Dr. Leon Silver uh, led Apollo 15 uh, astronauts in geology training. Um, Farouk Al-Baz uh, gave uh, Al Warden, um, I guess, how you describe it, better training on how to, to know what he was seeing from the command module as they were flying over the site. Um, Dave Scott did not want to do geology training. Uh, he did not want to do that. However, he did embrace it after they started into it. Uh, to the point, uh, they had to choose their landing site. One was a nice, easy landing site. Uh, the second was more difficult, more ha hazardous. However, it had the chance to yield uh, a better sample. And at the end of the day, they left some of the choice up to Dave. And Dave went with the geologists and said, let's go for the, if we're going to do it, let's go for the real sample. Um, he made that choice. Um, so this is where they landed on their Apollo 15 mission. And... Because they made that choice, they actually found the oldest lunar sample that we have. Uh, this was actually brought back, the Genesis rock was brought back from the Apollo 15 mission. Uh, something that Dave said, which I love that they talk about, he said, there's something good for the soul when you explore beautiful places, there's grandeur. And I uh, thought that was a, a pretty cool comment. Apollo 16, Ken Manning, when he would get uh, that chance to finally go fly. Uh, he never uh, did get the measles. Uh, they were, he was adamant that he was not going to get the measles. Um, Apollo 16 would get that chance, though. And then on 17, unfortunately, uh, this is them during some of that same training, though. You can see it's gotten more intense. Like, at first, they were just out there. Now they're actually carrying equipment, things like that. Um, but unfortunately, during Apollo 16, it was announced back on Earth that Apollo 17 would be the final mission of the Apollo program. They're going to close out the program. Um, a lot of people felt we had seen everything. Uh, that is not how the folks that worked at NASA felt. Uh, they felt that we had finally gotten a high ground. It was time to keep going. Um, but folks felt uh, differently here uh, in our government. Uh, Apollo 17 was the only night launch. Uh, the Saturn V would have loved to have seen. Um, and uh, some of the last photos taken from that mission. Uh, Gene Cernan, before he left, he actually carved his daughter's initials in the moon. And, uh, and said, hopefully we'll be back, uh, which uh, looks like we're getting ready to try to do that. Uh, so looking back, I always tell people, they ask, well, why, why did we go to the moon in the first place? We thought we were, we were going to yield some amazing things up there. Well, I think the first thing is we, we sent men up there, mankind, not necessarily men, um, because you have to fully evaluate that. It's an experience that, that you have to have people to describe. This is what it's like up there. Uh, for everybody else to fully get uh, what space flight is like. But second, it's it think about how many people. It took over 400,000 people uh, to put 
mankind up there. Uh, and for a brief period of time, people were pulling together again, sort of like stealing a World War II. Uh, the space program, it honors not anything else other than intelligence. That's what's important at NASA and places like that. Uh, so it, it's something for us to strive to. Um, Gene, uh, one of my favorite uh, Gene Cernan quotes was, uh, dream the impossible, then go make it happen. I landed on the moon, what can't you do? It makes you really feel like going out and doing something that you've been putting off for a while. Um, so what's my connection as we're sort of heading for the end? Well, these guys were all EAA members, a lot of them. Uh, so they would come to Oshkosh every year. So a few times they did have some reunions. Uh, this was in the 90s when they had that reunion. Um, I had the chance uh, to do the uh, Apollo 13 reunion uh, and uh, had Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes. And I was, I'll was i tell you a fun story about this. I desperately wanted to get a picture with them that year. And uh, it would be horribly unprofessional to ask them. But I'm like, oh, man, that sucks. you know. Uh, so we're at the Hilton getting ready to part ways for the night. And Fred Hayes is like, what? you didn't want to get a picture or anything? you know? And I was like, well, yeah, like, I'd love to, but I didn't want to offend you. They're like, no, let's get a picture. Uh, our F-86 Sabre was actually in the process of getting its markings redone. Ours didn't have like a big history, uh, and we were trying to figure out what to do with it, so we surprised Gene Kranz with it, and we painted it back as his aircraft. Uh, everybody talks to Gene Kranz about Apollo 11, Apollo 13. Nobody ever talks to him about his F-86 flying. Uh, named, the airplane is named after his wife. Uh, they're still married. Uh, Marta immediately told him that uh, that was her airplane and not his, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but that was the moment we surprised them with it. Um, so come Space Day, uh, I'd asked Gene Kranz to come and join us. And he says, I just uh, agreed to speak in Houston, so I can't. But I got somebody for you. And I, I said, okay. And I get a call, and it's like windy, and I can't really hear. And, and the guy says, that thing in October, I'll come and speak at it. And I'm like, that's great, but I have no idea who you are because I couldn't hear any of that. And he goes, oh, okay, hold on. And he gets into his hangar. He closes the door. He goes, can you hear me now? And I'm out of the wind. I said, yeah. And he goes, okay. He goes, yeah, that, I'll be your keynote in October. Gene called me. And I said, that's, uh, that's cool, but I didn't hear who you were. He goes, oh, this is Frank Borman. And I'm just quiet for a second because I'm like, holy crap, you know. And, uh, and he's just kind of quiet. And he's like, you know, like Apollo 8. And I was like, yeah, no, I know who you are. Like, I'm just, I can't figure out how I'm on the phone with you. And I said, well, we'll get your airline. He goes, no, I'll fly myself. Put his own T-34 in. And um, T-34, Air Force uh, trainer from the 50s and 60s. Um, you want to talk about someone that will make you want to be a better person. Uh, that's Frank Borman. Uh, Frank, uh, we call me. Um, we actually still talk probably about once a week or so. But he would uh, he call me and say, oh, I'm out at the airport just kind of hanging out. You know, and we're like, oh, that's cool. And I just thought he was out hanging out at the airport. What we later found out is uh, there were wildfires out in Montana. And he was flying his T-34 out there to spot wildfires and then radio them to the airplanes that could put out the fires with the big bore aid on board. Uh, so they were following Frank into the forest fires to put out the fires. Um, never mentioned that. And uh, it was a local newspaper in Montana that ran a story without him knowing. That was how we found out about it. Um, so when we went to do this Apollo reunion, um, we actually got a call from a guy named Tim Gagnon who designed some of the patches for space flight. And he says, would you guys like a patch? We'll design you your custom mission patch. I'm like, yeah. The geek in me is like, heck yeah, I want a mission patch. So uh, he did make us a, a mission patch, which was awesome. Um, and then, uh, let's see. Um, this was getting ready for one of the talks while they were there. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I, this is unreal. Um, so you got Gene Kranz, uh, Walt Cunningham, Jim Lovell, Al Warden, and Frank Foreman. And uh, I'm sitting there, I'm like, wow, I'm the only guy that didn't go into space. That's cool. And uh, except for Gene, but I guess he doesn't count. Uh, we're backstage, and uh, I'll never forget, these guys are all seeing each other and kind of talking, a lot of crosstalk. And the stage manager is kind of freaking out because he's like, we, we got to get them in order and we got to bring them out. And I'm like, how do I politely interrupt? these astronauts, you know, and I'm trying to think about it. And Gene comes over and goes, you want me to do it? You know, and I was like, yeah, I'd appreciate it, Gene. And he just pipes up in his mission control voice. 
and I'll never forget it. He was like, listen up, everybody. And everybody just like quiets down. And he's like, mm -hmm. we're going to go out there tonight. We're going to look professional. He's going to get us in the order that we want. And we're going to look good. Everybody's like, okay, Gene. I'm like, wow, he's he's still running the show. So, um, And uh, there's this uh, there's this quote out there that's always, uh, never meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed. That's the, that's the gist of that. Uh, whoever had that quote, uh, didn't have these guys as your heroes. Uh, Frank, when he gets there for mission control, um, you know, usually the talk is at like five or six in the evening. The event throughout the day is for kids. It starts at like 10 AM and Frank, uh, just goes, what time does this all start? And then we, I told him like how this all worked. And I'm like, so you can just kind of relax. I'll come get you for dinner. And he's like, no, no, I'll be there at 10. And, uh, and he spent the entire day with us, help kids build rockets and things like that. Uh, one of the nicest people and truly someone who has uh, uh, just really inspired me to want to be a better person. Uh, just uh, phenomenal. He describes his greatest accomplishment, not as any of his space missions, but marrying his wife, Susan. Uh, and Susan is an unsung hero for always encouraging Frank and being there for him. So truly incredible people. Um, this last slide, these are the people that helped me put this talk together. Um, you'll notice this last name. So uh, usually when you're putting an event together and you try to get someone from Hollywood involved, it doesn't happen because they're just busy and it's just kind of off the radar. Um, I will tell you, if you ever want to do that, go get an Apollo astronaut because it actually all works backwards. Uh, because then you have movie stars like, hey, that's really cool. I want to be part of that. You know, so uh, what happened is we're getting this together. And Frank Borman's like, you should call Tom Hanks and get Tom Hanks uh, involved in our reunion. I'm like, that's really cool, Frank. But I have no idea how to do that. And he goes, oh, here's his number. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so uh, so we get we get to his office and his folks are awesome. And, and Mr. Hanks is awesome. And he said, I'm out of the country uh, where I would love to do it. However, you really should talk. To Mark Harmon. Well, actually, he didn't tell me that. He just said, I have a guy you should talk to. Um, I get a call from this gentleman, and I also run the oral history program at, uh, at EAA. So it's not weird to get a call of someone saying, I have somebody you should interview, or I am calling to set up an interview. Totally normal day. You get a call, and the guy says, I'm, I'm, I was told to give you a call. That we should do an interview. And I was like, oh, you know, cool. And I said, like, well, what's your name? And he says, I'm Mark Harmon. And I'm like, Oh, that's, that's kind of funny. It's like the guy on uh, NCIS. And he's like, yeah, it's me. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, wait, really? And he's like, yeah, I'm Mark Harmon. I'm like, I'm like, like Gibbs? And he's like, yep, that's me. I'm like, holy cow. Okay. So uh, and he's like, I'm supposed to talk to you because I played Wally Shira from the Earth to the Moon. And so he set up this great, if you, if you ever want to go watch it, uh, we do a Green Dot podcast at EAA. And we actually had him on the Green Dot. Um, but he talked about the fact that uh, as a kid, uh, the story that, that why I was talking to him as a kid, his dad had taken him to run a work trip and he went to a hotel and he says, I, I ate up all this Apollo stuff. I loved it. And he said, uh, you know, every kid at that point did. And he said, we're there and in walks an Apollo astronaut. He's got the blue jacket and the sunglasses. And I'm like freaking out, you know, and, and we didn't know he was going to be there. We're checking in the hotel for my dad's work. And he says, I, I kind of tried to look around to see what his name tag was. And he caught me and he just pulled my sunglasses, his sunglasses off. And he goes, hey, kid, I'm Wally Shira. You know, and he says, and Wally took me aside and talked to me, some kid, for like a half hour about space flight and how cool it was and how I, what I need to do to get there. And he said, I never forgot that. And he says, so when this miniseries is coming up, I contacted them and said, I want to play Wally Shira. And Tom Hanks said, well, you don't look like Wally Shira. And he says, yeah, I don't care. Here's this story. <laughs> and he said, I told this story. And they said, it just kind of quiet. And he says, okay, you're Wally Shira. Uh, so uh, I got to go spend time with Wally. Uh, he said, I showed up in the driveway. And there he is out in the driveway, washing his Corvette out in the driveway, like just like a retired astronaut would be doing, you know. So uh, he said, uh, uh, my favorite quote from Mark Harmon, though, is he said, when I asked Wally, I was like, Wally, you were on the path to make Admiral in the Navy. And you gave that all up to go at NASA, which was completely new. What made you want to do that? And we cycle all the way back to Sputnik. And he says, uh, I'll, I'll give you the real answer, but it's not fancy. And, and Mark said, that's, that's fine. And 
he said, Sputnik pissed me off. And he says, I never wanted to see this country be second to the Russians. So uh, he said, I figured if I could help, uh, I would do it. And uh, that's what we did. So uh, so that's Wally Shura's long answer as, as to why he joined. But uh, so I'm incredibly thankful. I will tell you a, a last fun story is I would call like my mom and my wife when this was all happening. And I'd be like, well, you're not going to believe this today. I talked to Jim Lovell or I got the chance to talk to this legendary astronaut. And, and they'd be like, that's that's really cool. That's awesome. And then the day I came home and I was like, I talked to Mark Harmon today. Yeah. And they <laughs> like exploded. They're like, Mark Harmon, what? You know, I mean, so out of all these historic astronauts, that's the one that uh, uh, that, that really uh, resonated with them. But really a genuine person, though. It was a really, uh, really great choice for him to, to be playing uh, Wally. So uh, I'll open it up for questions in case you guys have any. I'll hang out. But uh, I do thank you guys for having me. It's an honor. Thank you. What's that? Tumblebuck in the Frank Barber collection. Yeah, so um, so um, when we became I became friends with some of these guys, you know, and and uh, I get a call one day, and Frank just says, uh, "Hey, uh, do you want some stuff? You don't have any space stuff. You want some?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, that's pretty cool. We'd love to have some in the museum." And he goes, "Well, I have a few items. Why don't you come out to my ranch and get it?" And I said, okay. So um, I said, do you think a van will be enough? You know, big enough? I have no concept of what any of this is. And he said, yeah, a van will be fine. So we get there. Uh, we drove from here to Montana. Actually, where they film Yellowstone is like right on its front porch. Uh, and uh, they're like, we're like, cool, we're here. And he goes, well, I like you. And then for a brief second, I kind of freaked out. They're like, oh my God, he's decided not to give us anything. And he's like, uh, I've decided that I'm going to give you everything. I want to give you my entire collection. Uh, so we thought we were getting maybe 10, 12 items. We came home with over 1,000. Uh, we actually had to rent a different truck uh, to get it all home, which sounds like it'd be not a problem, except for uh, in Montana. It's really spread out. So the closest town was an hour and a half away. Uh, that's no joke. Uh, the closest town was Billings. Uh, so we had to drive to Billings to go get a rental truck. Uh, and all kinds of packing material. And it's an hour and a half at 90 miles an hour. It's, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, is, it is every bit of an hour and a half. Uh, so what we would do is we would uh, we'd work all morning. We'd, and our hotel was in Billings. Um, okay. So what we would do is we would uh, leave the hotel in the morning, drive out to the ranch, and then we would uh, load all day until lunch. And then we would come back because by that time we'd be out of packing material. We'd have to find a different Home Depot or something in Lowe's to just clean them out of, of, of packing material. After lunch, drive back out there. We'd work till about nine o'clock at night and then we would drive home. But uh, we brought every piece home, not one piece got damaged. I can tell you that those couple nights driving home with a truck full of uh, stuff, we weren't gonna rest easy regardless. I mean, these are priceless items. Some of them had flown on Gemini 7 and Apollo 8. Um, and when we're getting ready to leave Frank's driveway, I'll never forget what he said. Uh, his last words to us on that trip, where I'm trusting you with my life. And you don't take that from Frank lightly. And uh, so because you knew these items were the items that he saved, and he wasn't a guy that saved everything from the space program. Uh, so for him, this was these were truly special. Uh, some of them were the telegrams that people sent from Apollo 8. Uh, we now have archived. We scanned them and made a whole wall full of them uh, that you can go and check out, which is pretty wild. We have the one that says you saved 68. It's the only one I don't have. He has He has it. Uh, so he has it. Yeah, I've seen it, um, but uh, he has it. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. Uh, so that night, no, those couple nights in the hotel, uh, we actually took shifts sleeping um, because we contacted the Smithsonian on the way home, or well before we left, and we're like, hey, you know, what would you advise? And they were like, tell no one, talk to no one, uh, sleep in shifts because like if people, if like if there are people who have hits out on this stuff, like from other countries, and if they know it's being in transport, they'll try and find you. And it was really pretty intense. Like it was more than we thought. Uh, so, uh, so that happens. So we get it all back. We created the uh, the exhibit. I don't think I have a picture of the exhibit in here. I don't. Um, but if you want to come up and see the exhibit, we do have it. Uh, on top of all that, we get done. And we put everything out there, and we're really proud of it. And we get a call from Joe and Jeannie Angle. And Joe and Jeannie Angle are amazing people. Jeannie, in her own right, she's very bashful about it, but she has an amazing NASA career as well. 
uh, Joe, of course, uh, X-15 all the way through the shuttle program. And uh, they said, you did a great job with, uh, with Frank's items. We, we'd like to donate our entire collection as well. Uh, so now we went from having nothing I mean, we literally had, I think we had a bumper sticker that said, I love EAA, that was on the <laughs> shuttle. Uh, that was the extent of our space items. And now our gallery side-by-side uh, -side covers the X-15, actually all the way through to the shuttle program uh, because of these guys. Um, we, Frank even had a few, he never flew in uh, Mercury, but he did have some Mercury items. Uh, like he has a, a, in our exhibit, we have a signed photo of all the Mercury 7 astronauts together uh, that was given to all the, the uh, astronauts when you were coming into the program. So uh, we have Franks up there. We, if you want to freak the people out at like Michael's, take an American flag that's been to the moon and say like, hey, I need to frame this, uh, which is what we did because we needed a big frame. We're like, we can take it to Michael's. Uh, so we took it in there and they were just like, are you serious right now? We're like, yeah, we need to get like this UV glass and everything, you know, uh, it's really, uh, really pretty funny, but uh, um, really very lucky to be the caretakers of these items. So if you're into space flight at all, or you're just curious about it, feel free to come up and uh, check out the, the museum. We have some really priceless artifacts in, in the collection. Yeah. I pro hopefully I didn't go too long for you guys. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys. I'll hang out in case you have any questions. So see you. Thank you.